Good afternoon. Uh, we've got two speakers again today. It's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Min. Rachel joined the Vancouver Airport Authority in January 2015 as a noise information officer. In her role, she assists in various noise management projects and complaint handling. That sounds fun. She received a BA in International Relations from UBC and a diploma in Airport Operations from BCIT. Prior to joining the Airport Authority, she worked in the airline operations and she administered and coordinated flight crew schedules and training. And Mark Christopher Chen received his uh, Bachelor of Applied Science and Master of Engineering uh, here with Murray Hodgson from the University of British Columbia. He joined the Vancouver Airport Authority in 1996 as a noise analyst and is currently the supervisor of the noise management and air quality programs. In his role, Mark has completed numerous noise mitigation studies, worked with stakeholders to create noise management plans, and has worked at YVR Master Plan and Airside Capacity Projects. So welcome to both of you. Thank you very much, and I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today. As a former uh, UBC um, graduate, it's always nice to come back on campus and see the changes, see the students, and I can also speak on behalf of Rachel as well. Um, thank you very much again for attending the seminar and um, giving up your time to listen to us speak. Uh, we're going to do kind of a joint presentation. I'm going to kind of do most of the talking, but I've invited Rachel to kind of do uh, some talking in the middle. Uh, what we plan to do over the next uh, 45 minutes is kind of give you a broad overview of uh, noise management practices um, at the airport and give you a general understanding of w what we do and, and, and how we do things at the airport. So in terms of the presentation outline, uh, I'll give you guys some background and context. Uh, talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities, as you can imagine, in a very complex issue of managing noise. There's a number of different partners that we have to work with. Talk about some of the key elements of the noise management program at Vancouver. And uh, I think if you look at any noise management program at other airports, most of them have some of the similar very key elements as, as well. So we'll cover some of those. Uh, we thought what might be good is to maybe cover a bit of a case study um, to look at uh, a particular issue at Vancouver and how the management strategy has, has, has evolved over time to come up with the solutions that we have today. And we'll end the presentation with just talking about some uh, emerging issues that we see coming on the horizon as noise management professionals in the aviation industry. So a little bit of background, talk a little bit about the Vancouver International Airport. Uh, we're located on Sea Island uh, within the city of Richmond. We're a gateway between Asia Pacific and North America. And what that basically means is that uh, we are the shortest flight distance between any Asian city and uh, cities in North America. So it, it actually lends itself to you know, people coming in and then transiting through Vancouver to other points in North America or South America as well. We consider ourselves a regional hub, which means we accommodate a very diverse mix of aircraft on our runways, which makes things very, very challenging um, to move traffic in and around the area. For example, if you were to go to some of the major uh, airports in Europe, say London Heathrow, and you were to look out the window, you would generally see large size aircraft. You wouldn't normally see a lot of smaller aircraft. Whereas if you come to Vancouver, about 50% of our traffic is smaller propeller aircraft. And these are, these, uh, these are the types of planes that would be servicing you know, smaller communities within British Columbia. So we're very unique in, 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 in that sense. Uh, we're the second busiest airport in Canada behind Toronto, and like all international airports in Canada, we're open 24 hours a day, although we do have some restrictions, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how we manage noise at night uh, later on in my presentation. Looking at the airfield layout, uh, this picture shows you kind of the airfield at Vancouver. The runway at the top is uh, what we call our North Parallel Runway. It was opened up in 1996. Even though it's you know, 20 years old, we still consider it our, our new North Parallel Runway. Uh, the runway at the bottom, uh, also running in a kind of east to west direction, is what we call our 24-hour south, south Parallel Runway. Um, for, uh, for a number of uh, noise reasons, uh, you know, there, there are actually some conditions on the use of the North Runway to mitigate noise. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, uh, conditions uh, in my presentation. And down towards the south um, of the airport, uh, along the river, is where we have a lot of the float planes and helicopters that operate uh, at the airport. 
So in 2014, um, the runway, uh, the airport accommodated roughly 270,000 landings and takeoffs on our surface runway. So just to put that into perspective, during a busy summer day, that's about uh, 1,000 landings and takeoffs uh, during the day. And then during the winter period, that number drops uh, to about six, six to 700 arrivals or departures. On top of those numbers, we have about 30,000 uh, float planes and helicopters that operate um, out at the airport. So it's a pretty busy um, uh, airport. In terms of the airspace around Vancouver, um, it's probably one of the most complex pieces of airspace in all of Canada. Uh, one of the reasons, or a number of reasons, uh, a couple of them are we have the mountains to the north and our neighbors from the United States directly to the south. So it compresses a lot of these aircraft into a very tight geographic area. Not only that, but we have a number of different smaller airports operating in the region. We have Coal Harbor out near Stanley Park, Boundary Bay and Delta, uh, Pitt Meadows, Langley, Abbotsford, Bellingham. And then just, to the, just off the map, we have Nanaimo and Victoria. So it's a very, very complex piece of airspace. A little bit about the company that Rachel and I work for, uh, the Vancouver Airport Authority. Uh, we were established in 1992. We're a private not-for-profit corporation. So what that means is uh, any profits that the company makes, we have to reinvest it back into um, uh, airport services and construction and stuff like that. So uh, if we were a private for-profit company, you know, all those profits at the end of the year would get divvied up to shareholders and everyone would be happy. But for us, all the profits we earn get reinvested back into the airport. Uh, it's a very unique model for, um, for operating airports, uh, and it's basically a, a made-in-Canada model, and I think it actually works really well. Um, on top of that, we actually lease um, the lands that we operate from the federal government. So we're just tenants at the airport. The federal government still owns the land um, that we operate from, and we actually pay them an annual ground rent for the privilege of running their facility. Um, we have a community-based board of directors um, that kind of guides our operations at the airport. And these are people appointed from uh, various professional associations, so um, professional association of geoscientists and engineers, law society, accountants. Um, so they all appoint people to our board. There's also members appointed from the various cities as well. Under our ground lease with Transport Canada, um, the airport authority is responsible for managing noise. So that's why uh, Rachel and I have, uh, are, are in our roles, because it's actually required under our, our, our ground lease. In saying that, Transport Canada, being the federal government, still has responsibility for regulations and enforcement of um, um, regulations and the Canadian aviation regulations. Talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities. I'll start at a high level and kind of get down lower. Um, so these are some of the players that um, have their hand in uh, managing aircraft noise. At the highest level, we have the International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, the next layer under that, obviously, is the federal government, Transport Canada. Our partners uh, in air traffic control uh, is a company called Nav Canada. And they're structured much like the airport authority. They are, they are, they are as well, a private not-for-profit um, company. Airports, and as well as local cities. And throughout my presentation, I'll kind of dive into um, where some of these organizations have their uh, in hand um, uh, and their role in, in uh, managing noise. So starting with ICAO and Transport Canada, ICAO essentially is a UN agency. Uh, established basically back in 1944. And their main role is to develop standards and recommendations to make sure aviation is safe, secure, and efficient. So one of the things that uh, ICAO does is they come out with a number of standards for aviation. So for example, if I'm a pilot and I'm flying into Vancouver, or I'm flying into somewhere in Europe, or I'm flying into the United States or Africa, the runway markings and the apron markings, the taxi markings, all look the same. And that is important because you wouldn't want to fly to another airport and their stop signs look completely different. So this is what ICAO does. They standardize aviation to make it safe and secure. They also have various committees that kind of help them create these policies and regulations and standards. Uh, so the committee responsible for aircraft noise and emissions is called Committee on Aviation Environmental 
Environmental Protection, or what they call CAPE. And that was established in 1983. And as I said, they, they look at noise certification of aircraft, emission standards, and the such. So on CAPE, there are 23 member states, including Canada. Also, there are a number of organizations that have official observer status. So they don't get to say anything at the meetings, but they can listen. And during the breaks, they can talk to the official members. I wouldn't say lobby, but you know, they get to exchange ideas with, uh, you know, with the members that sit on CAPE. So as observers, um, airports are represented through our, uh, essentially, our international advocacy group. And that group is called the Airports Council International. So they sit as observers and they can exchange ideas with uh, the official members of CAPE. Um, so for Canada, uh, the official member is a person from Transport Canada, a person by the name of Gilles Bourgeois, who's from Ottawa, and he's our official representative to CAPE. So Transport Canada's role is not only to participate in CAPE and, and you know, provide their input and, and guidance on, 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 on these standards, but also to adopt the standards and recommendations from CAPE into the regulations that then govern aviation in Canada. So what does that mean for aircraft noise certification? Um, so uh, ICAO has a book called Annex 16, Volume 1, Aircraft Noise. Sounds very, very official. Uh, so in this book, um, it outlines the criteria for uh, noise certification of jet aircraft. And if you can think about it, um, it, puts it, it puts aircraft into several bins or categories. And these categories are called Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 4, and most recently, Chapter 15. The thing you need to know is the, the higher number you go, the quieter your aircraft. So Chapter 2 aircraft are generally the ones that were developed in you know, the, the 80s and the 90s, you know, very old technology, very noisy. Chapter 14 is newer modern aircraft that are too yet to be coming into service. So certification against the Annex um, criteria is actually based on noise measurements done at the time when manufacturers are testing the prototypes of their aircraft. So you know, as they're doing all their um, airworthiness uh, trials, Part of those trials includes noise and emissions. So this figure here shows the, uh, essentially the measurement locations that, uh, that the, uh, that the uh, certification levels are taken at. So you've got one point underneath the approach, you know, one off to the sideline, and one uh, at takeoff. So um, as they do these trials, they, they get these noise values, and then they compare them to how they fit within kind of the um, um, kind of the where they fit within the categories. To talk a little bit about the categories, and I should mention that actually Canada, the United States, and Europe have actually passed legislation that says any commercial jet aircraft over 34,000 kilograms must meet Chapter 3 standards. So if you're uh, a, a, an aircraft and you're over 34,000 kilograms operating in Canada, you cannot be a Chapter 2 aircraft. They said, no, you're too noisy, um, you, you can't operate, you have to meet Chapter 3 or above. So what does that mean in terms of noise certification levels? And it's a question that Rachel and I often get is, how much noise is our aircraft actually allowed to make? So if you flip open the uh, ICAO Annex, this table here shows you the maximum certification level to meet Chapter 3 standards. And as you can see, to answer that question of how much noise am I allowed, or this aircraft allowed to make, it's a very complex um, uh, answer. First of all, it's actually based on the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft. So as you see, these numbers in white at the top represent the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft in 1,000 in thousand kilograms. And the rows in the table, the first row is the lateral noise level, the second uh, line or row is the approach noise level. And the last uh, line, it's kind of broken into three categories, is the takeoff noise level. And as you can see, the takeoff noise level depends on the number of engines on the aircraft. If you have two engines, it's different than three, and it's different for four. And as you can see, you, you kind of have to see where you fit, calculate the number, and that would be your limit that you would have to meet in order to make Chapter 3 certification. So to give you an example, 
Uh, this top picture is a uh, common uh, large aircraft that operates into Vancouver. It's a Boeing 777-300 extended range, or ER. According to Wikipedia, um, the maximum takeoff weight of this aircraft is uh, 350,000 kilograms. So if I wanted to see what level this aircraft had to uh, have in order to meet Chapter 3 standards, I'd kind of look at the table and kind of the number in red there shows you know, the, the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft. And as you go down, the lateral noise would be 102. The approach would be 105. And the takeoff, because it's two engines, uh, would be 100. And you'll notice the units here are EPN dB, so effective perceived noise level. It's essentially a metric that is only used for aircraft. Um, uh, as far as I know, it's only used for aircraft noise certification. No one else kind of uses it in, in kind of the general uh, um, acoustical uh, industry. So what this means is during those noise trials, at those three measurement locations, this aircraft would have to produce less than those values in order to be Chapter 3 certified. And we know that this aircraft actually meets Chapter 4. So it, it actually produces less than uh, the numbers represented in the green boxes. So what does this all mean um, in terms of the transition in fleets? Well, modern aircraft are much quieter than older generation aircraft. So when I started at the airport in 96, we had a lot of older Chapter 2 aircraft at that time operating. And you know, based on our noise measurements and data that we have, you know, there's been a significant decrease in the levels of noise generated by um, kind of these new aircraft. Uh, airlines are also investing billions in new aircraft. Um, not only are they quiet, but they're more fuel efficient. Uh, they're more effective to operate. They're you know they have less operating cost. So there's uh, a financial incentive for the airlines to upgrade their fleets. And worldwide, Canada actually has one of the youngest fleets in the world, meaning you know they have a lot of new aircraft um, in the mix. And this bottom um, picture here is an illustration of. Uh, kind of the newest uh, aircraft in the Air Canada fleet. It's the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Um, so if some of you are uh, aviation um, uh, enthusiasts, you know, it's made out of a lot of composite materials, very fuel efficient engine, probably 20% more efficient than the aircraft that they're replacing. Indeed, uh, aircraft standards have also increased. So uh, as I talked about, you know, when I first started, at the airport, they only had chapter two and chapter three. So, you know, in my uh, 20 year career, I was introduced chapter four and chapter uh, 15. So the standards have gotten um, higher as well. So the uh, maximum permitted noise levels have gone down as well. And a lot of manufacturers are designing new aircraft to meet, um, you know, the highest noise standard possible because they probably foresee that at some point governments will start phasing out chapter three aircraft. Et cetera, et cetera. So getting down to a local level, uh, why do we manage noise? Well, um, you know, first of all, we're obligated to in the ground lease. It clearly says we're responsible for managing noise. Uh, also, the airport authority is directly accountable to the community through our board of directors. I mentioned it's kind of this community-based organization. Uh, you know, we want to be a re responsible corporate citizen and reduce you know, much like any company, when we want to reduce all our environmental impacts, whether it's noise, emissions, uh, you know, garbage, uh, all that kind of thing. We want to mitigate political and legal risk to our operations and allow us to continue to serve the community. And the last bullet is probably the most important one. It, we, you know, we do this to allow for new and continued business development. I think if you were to look at any major airport infrastructure project going on in the world, either a new runway or a brand new airport, one of the biggest holdups is you know, noise and emissions um, on the community. So again, drilling down, talking a little bit about the noise management program, and we'll cover some of these elements um, in the upcoming slides. Some of the key elements of not only the program at Vancouver, but as I said, if you were to look at the program at Toronto International or Heathrow, probably has the same elements. Stakeholder participation in the process, um, noise abatement procedures, you know, compatible land use planning, uh, noise monitoring flight tracking, and complaint management. Kind of all form kind of the core elements of the program. 
So in terms of stakeholder participation, how that works at Vancouver and other airports as well, is we have a consultative um, uh, airport noise management committee. So the purpose of this committee is to provide advice and um, recommendations to the airport around our noise management plans. So who is involved in this committee? Well, we have citizen representatives. So our current citizens represent Vancouver, Richmond, Corporation of Delta, and Surrey. And they're appointed by uh, their respective uh, cities um, to represent the, in, uh, the, the, um, uh, the residents on our, on, our, on our committee. Those same cities also appoint city staff. And it's generally people from their policy planning or planning groups that, that sit on our committee. Airlines, air traffic control, First Nations, a number of different industry associations and, and business associations as well as Transport Canada. Um, being the regulator, they, they still need to be involved in some of the discussions. And so we chair this committee, um, and it meets three or four times a year. And this is where we get input from uh, various groups on, 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 a, on how to address various issues. Talk a little bit about the noise abatement procedures. So a lot of people may be familiar with uh, municipal noise bylaws in their community that probably say you can't have an you know, loud party after 11 o'clock, or you can't cut your grass at 4 in the morning. Um, since we're federally regulated, those municipal bylaws don't apply to us. But what do apply to us is something called published noise abatement procedures. So these are federal uh, procedures uh, that were developed underneath Canadian Aviation Regulation 602-105, noise operating criteria. They're published in this fancy looking document called the Canada Air Pilot. And they typically cover things like uh, preferential runways, uh, restricted hours of operation at the airport, uh, arrival departure procedures, things like that. Things like that. Important thing to note, because it's enforceable or because it was created underneath the Canadian Aviation Regulations, anything that is stated in, 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 in our noise abatement procedures are enforceable by, by Transport Canada. So if somebody were to operate in non-compliance, Transport Canada can issue sanctions. And that can be suspend a person's pilot license, uh, mostly issue fines of anywhere from up to $5,000 for an individual, all the way up to $25,000 for a corporation. So what do these procedures translate, or how do they translate to kind of our day-to-day -day activities? We thought we would just kind of look at some of the procedures that exist for minimizing noise at night. So as I mentioned, our quote unquote new north parallel runway uh, is closed between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. except for emergencies and maintenance. And that was part of the environmental commitments that the minister had made at the time for approving the construction of the north runway. Um, so during those hours, all traffic then gets diverted to our uh, existing south runway um, uh, to operate at night. One other criteria we have at night is approval required for departure of jet aircraft over 34,000 kilograms, maximum takeoff weight, between the hours of midnight and 6. So for example, if you wanted to start a service with a jumbo jet, you would actually have to get approval from the airport authority before you operate. And one of the things we look at when we look at that request is, is that, um, is that flight carrying goods or passengers through Vancouver. So is it actually generating an economic value for the community? If it is, we'll approve that flight. If it's not, if it's, you know, if it's just stopping in Vancouver for gas, or it's got to leave to, you know, it's dropping passengers off, and then it's got to fly to Edmonton for the first flight of the day in the morning, we generally deny those flights. Uh, and say, no, you either have to overnight here or you have to adjust your schedule such that you're operating outside, um, outside the night hours of midnight and 6. Does that happen often? Not very often now, because airlines actually don't like to fly you know, empty. It's, it's a non-revenue flight. So they will do whatever they can in their schedule to make sure they don't have uh, empty flights. What we do run into issue is often is with you know, sports charters. Uh, people dropping off the local sports team and then you know, that aircraft then has to go to Edmonton for a 6 o'clock flight the next morning. So, you know, they want to drop the team off at 1 and then leave at 3 o'clock to reposition the aircraft back into Edmonton. And I'm looking at Rachel here because she had to play the hammer uh, this week in, in denying one of those flights. So, 
that's, that's why we brought you on, Rachel. Uh, some of the other things we have in our noise abatement procedures, preferential runways and vectoring procedures, and these graphs at the bottom, or these figures help kind of illustrate that. Uh, the first one on the left depicts nighttime two-way direction flow. So for the most part, um, um, uh, you know, aircraft have to land and take off into the wind, you know, for safety reasons. Uh, in general, you know, um, during the day when the, when the traffic is busy, traffic moves in one direction. So you have landings, say, coming from the east and then departures to the east or vice versa, depending on which way the wind is blowing at the airport. At night, because traffic is low and between the hours of midnight and six, we have an average of, you know, 25 flights um, during that six hour period. Uh, air traffic control accommodates two-way flow, so we have both arrivals and departures out over the water. And this is extremely unique for an international airport. I, I can't think of, well, there is no airport in Canada that does two-way flow, and it'd be very hard-pressed for me to identify another airport in the United States that actually does most basically head-to-head -head operations. But, you know, we have very good air traffic controllers in the lower mainland, and uh, they help us out as much as they can. On occasions where flights do need to depart over the city, um, the figure to the right shows what happens for um, Asia-bound aircraft that have to depart eastbound due to winds. So the, um, basically, the, you know, we try to go with two-way flow until the tailwind gets to about five knots, and as soon as that happens, the aircraft has to be pointed into the wind. So there are some occasions where we do have um, uh, a number of Asia-bound departures at night. Uh, so this kind of depicts, this green line here depicts the departure flight track of an aircraft heading to Asia. So as you can see, what the controllers do is they try to vector or direct the aircraft over less populated areas as they leave the airspace. So for this, they actually fly, you know, they try to actually aim the aircraft over Burns Bog, you know, out around the peninsula of Tawasin, and then out over the uh, water to the west. Um, and uh, it's something that we um, welcome their assistance on. Talk a little bit about land use planning. So this is where cities get involved in helping us manage noise. Obviously, uh, they have uh, the ability to to plan their cities um, uh, and hopefully incorporate noise uh, accordingly. Uh, so in British Columbia, municipalities are delegated the responsibility for uh, planning. So the city of Vancouver is responsible for their planning, city of Richmond, et cetera, et cetera. To help them develop in and around the vicinity of airports, Transport Canada provides guidelines uh, to assist with compatible land use planning. And they're based on contours, um, what we call noise exposure forecast, or NEF. Um, so the little figure to the right here shows kind of the noise exposure forecast, typical you know, contours of equal noise energy. And what Transport Canada says is, you know, we don't recommend residential developments within areas of greater than, exposed to um, uh, NEF values greater than 30. So what would that look like um, in the Lower Mainland here? Um, so this is a map of the Lower Mainland, uh, the airport kind of um, uh, centered there. Uh, this line would show kind of the NEF 30 value according to our planning contour of 2015. So according to Transport Canada, they would recommend no residential development in this area. Uh, well, if anybody's been to Richmond, you'll obviously know there's a lot of development that's happening kind of in and around the number three road, taking obviously advantage of the new Canada line, densifying Richmond city center. And that just so happens to lie right underneath our flight path. So, you know, anytime we get a development application for comment, it's generally, you know, we don't think this is a great idea. Um, you know, it's not compatible with uh, Transport Canada recommendations. So what the city has done is obviously, as I mentioned, they, they do permit developments in high noise areas. But um, in about 2004, we worked very hard with the city to develop criteria that they should apply to developments in the area. You know, we said, okay, listen, if you're going to develop, perhaps you should have uh, a require a certain level of sound insulation. Perhaps you need to look at, you know, covenants uh, indemnifying both the city and the airport for, you know, noise and and nuisance in the area. 
And for certain developments, you know, you need to disclose to the person purchasing the property that they're moving into an area that's exposed to aircraft, low-flying aircraft, high noise, etc. So the city does this as part of their kind of development process, depending where you are in the city, you may or may not be able to build, that's the first thing. Second, if you are building, um, they generally, in a high noise area, they would generally prefer you build a multifamily um, development, like a townhouse or a condo. That's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? And you, you think you'd want single family homes to have less people living in uh, high noise areas, but you know, I, I guess it, I guess it, it may be easier to sound insulate a condo. Maybe there's not this expectation that you have a yard and maybe easier to incorporate HVAC. A number of reasons why the city kind of went that way. Um, so we work collectively with the city to administer this, um, this policy in Richmond. So a lot of the development, as I said, is, is not compatible per the Transport Canada guidelines. But you know, we understand the um, Richmond's pressure of developing Actually, a lot of the lands to the east are tied up in agricultural land reserve. So they're really constrained as to where they can actually densify. So, you know, we have to kind of balance everything. Um, Rachel, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, just an FYI, <laughs> that sporting team still came in. They just couldn't leave. So, <laughs> so it wasn't completely bad. <laughs> so the another um, another program area that we have um, for noise management is noise monitoring and flight tracking. So YVR has been monitoring noise since 1988, which is from the Transport Canada days when they used to manage and operate the airport. To help us better monitor and track the flights, we installed. Um, a system called Aircraft Noise and Operations Monitoring System, or we, we refer to it as ANOMS, in 2009. And currently, we have 20 noise monitoring terminals in the lower mainland, which looks like the one in the picture that has a microphone sticking out there. So what it does is that at each monitoring terminals that we set a threshold, and it monitors the, the sound level in the area and um, anything that it the, uh, the threshold will be registered as a noise event. And um, we receive the um, radar data from NAV Canada, which helps um, the system to know that whether the, the noise event is related to aircraft noise or community noise. And all that data gets transmitted to our ANOM server, so we can actually look at the details of noise, noise event, and uh, we can also play the noise event from our ANOM system. Uh, the, the noise data that we, we collect are used for informational and um, educational purposes only. It's not uh, used as infraction. Um, so it really helps us better communicate with our community and the city staff just to give them a good idea of the, uh, the noise footprint in our communities. It also helps us understand the trends of the aircraft noise. As Mark mentioned, there are Chapter 2 aircraft, Chapter 3 aircraft, um, Chapter 4. So Manufacturers do say, yeah, aircraft has gotten quieter, quieter sorry, but um, we can actually see the aircraft noise level from 10 years ago and pull the data from the same station with the aircraft noise of 787 Dreamliner, and we can see the significant differ difference of the noise level. We also have a um, system called WebTrack. It is an online tool for the community use, and they can actually look at the live and historical tracks online and see how the aircraft navigate over Lower Mainland. And um, I will show you the screenshot of that in a bit. So this map shows where our noise monitoring terminals are located in the Lower Mainland. So as you can see here, most of the terminals are installed in the vicinity of the airport, which makes sense because that's where the noise, where most of the noise events happen. But we also have um, terminals out, out very far away from the airport around here. Uh, that will be 20 to 30 kilometers away from the airport. And the reason why we have the terminals out there is because aircraft do navigate all over the lower mainland. They need to come in and out of the airport somehow because they don't land and take off vertically. And the next slide will show you a better idea of how, how aircraft navigate over the lower mainland. So this is a sample flight tracks from 
our ANOM system, and this is over a four-hour period. As Mark mentioned, we have a very busy airspace with uh, a number of different aerodromes around us. And um, as you can see out there, and you see that aircraft coming in and out, even out to Surrey, and although they are really higher up, there is really no area in the lower mainland that doesn't have any impacts from aircraft, whether it's whether the, the community is right under the flight path or it could experience a side noise or sideline noise. So this is a screenshot of the web track that's available online. As I mentioned, this is an online tool that's available for the community to look at how aircraft navigate over our communities. Um, you can play the real time, which is 10 minutes delayed for the secure, due to security, security reasons. And um, you can also look at the historical tracks and replay the flights. Some of the features include that you can look at aircraft type. You can look at the speed of the aircraft and the altitude of the aircraft over your area. You can also locate where your home is. And it will show you the closest uh, point where the aircraft is in relation to your location. Um, another feature it has that people can tag a specific event, aircraft um, activity, and they can they can log a concern or questions to us. Having said that, moving on to managing our community concerns. So as Mark, as Mark mentioned, um, under the provision of the ground lease that we have with Transport Canada, we are responsible for noise management, and that includes handling complaints within 10 nautical mile radius from the airport. But we also respond and um, provide information to our communities that are located outside of 10 nautical miles. The objective of managing our community concerns is to provide information and really educate our, our community how aircraft and airport operate and how airspace works and uh, why things are sometimes done in a certain way and also to give them an idea what we do to mitigate noise and uh, some of the mitigation uh, measures that we have in place. This really leads to um, setting and managing realistic expectation from the community in terms of how we manage noise and the uh, airport operations. Um, also, managing the community concerns, we can identify activities of concern. And this helps us identify study areas where we want to review how we, how we um, manage noise and some of, uh, just assess the, the the um, practice that we currently have. Currently, most of the concerns come through email, web track, and phone, uh, telephone. And um, as we move forward, um, we might see more a number of concerns coming in through Twitter and Facebook. We don't see a lot of them just yet, but that's something that we may have to look into in the future. So you might be wondering what we do with the noise concerns that comes in. So the, uh, when we receive the complaint, each complaint gets logged into our database in ANOMS. And using the ANOMS system and looking at the flight tracks and all the information that we have, we investigate each complaint and we get back to our community members um, and explain how, why things were this way and whatnot. And with all the information that we have, all the data that we have, we, we perform trend analysis and see, as I mentioned, identify activities of a concern. And we do present it to our committee members um, every time we meet with them. We may discuss possible solutions with our operators, air traffic control, and also our noise management committee. During our investigation, if we see any suspected violations, that will be um, forwarded to Transfer Canada for further investigation, as they are the regulator of all aviation in Canada. So this graph shows the um, annual noise concerns from 2010 to 2014. So the blue bar shows the number of concerns, and the green bar shows number of individuals. And um, you may notice that you may have noticed that there are really no correlations between the number of concerns and number of individuals who log concerns. Um, it really depends on how many frequent frequent complainers we have each year. And um, last year, we received over 1,700 complaints from 278 individuals. And 
you might be thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot. <laughs> but just to put a perspective and also a fun fact, um, one of the major international airports in the US, they received over 19,000 complaints in one month. So I, I think what we have here is pretty good. And we have a really good, good relationship with the community. And I think the program is working pretty well, although over, one, over 1,700 looks a lot. It's really relatively low. Uh, this map shows our noise concerns from 2014 by region. So I have mentioned that uh, we are responsible for managing complaints within 10 nautical miles from the airport. So this, the circle, the black circle here is the, um, the 10 nautical mile circle. And each dot uh, represents uh, where individual resides in the lower mainland um, who have uh, submitted concerns to us. And the bigger the dot is, the more complaints that individual has lodged. And uh, yeah, it's, it's obvious that we have more, um, more individuals putting in concerns, requesting information in the, close, uh, in, in the vicinity of the airport. But you may have noticed that some of our frequent um, complainers are located well outside of the 10 nautical mile circle. And uh, this really shows that, um, that noise is a subjective matter. And uh, it's one of the challenges that we have because it's subjective that something that the aircraft, even though it's really higher in, in some of those communities, that, that we still need to communicate with them and um, provide information. And that's why we, we still manage the complaints outside of 10 nautical miles. Rachel, so I'll we'll quickly cover off uh, the last couple of topics here. Talk a little bit about a case study um, that shows how kind of noise management practices evolve. And uh, the case study I'm going to use is um, uh, how, we, how we evolved looking at managing run-up noise from the airport. But before I do that, first of all, a run-up is something that's conducted after maintenance. And it's done by the mechanics to make sure that the aircraft is working properly before it's being put into service. I don't think you'd want the mechanics tinkering with an airplane and then having the pilots figure out when there's passengers in the back that something either didn't get fixed or the mechanics created another problem. So typically after extended period of maintenance, they're required to run the engines up, test them, go through their checklist before they sign it off for, for service the next morning. Since a lot of these flights are operating during the day, a lot of these maintenance activities occur at night, because that's the only time the crews can get access to the aircraft. So these run-ups can be 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, full power, up and down in power, in the middle of the night. Right? So highly annoying to the surrounding communities. And roughly there are about 5,000 run-ups that occur during the course of a year. So that translates to about 10 to 15 per day. Not all of them at full power, mostly at idle, but some of them do have to be run at full power. So how we, how, how we um, the first level of control that we put on run-ups is kind of what I'll call procedural control. So we look at, uh, you know, restricting by time of day, you know, power setting, different locations on the airfield, maybe locations that are closer to the community we would restrict and not use at night, but allow during the day when kind of the ambient noise level is higher. Uh, you know, but because these run-ups are conducted um, in the open, you know, noise propagates into the community. And we were having this issue, uh, continued issue, not a lot of concerns actually when you compare it to other stats, but we felt it was something that we could kind of take on and manage. It's very difficult to manage when aircraft are flying. You can't really tell it to, you know, stop or, you know, use less engine thrust. But perhaps there's things we can do on the ground. So the next level of control is we look at engineering control. And due to the changing nature of operations, this became um, something that we could actually do. So when I first started at the airport, a lot of the maintenance was done on large jet aircraft. So if we wanted to build an enclosure or a berm, it would have to be huge. And we just don't have space. Uh, but recently, a lot of that maintenance of heavy jet aircraft has actually gone overseas, either to Asia or to South America. So what we're left at at the airport is a lot of run-ups of smaller propeller aircraft. So if we're going to look at solution, obviously the facility gets smaller. So in 2010, we looked at a number of different engineering controls and we focused on developing uh, an enclosure, three-sided pen. Some of the design, consider so design considerations, location, you have to be very close to the operators. You don't want it on the opposite side of the field. 
noise mitigation, got to make sure that it actually works. Uh, airport zoning in terms of height restrictions, extremely difficult to build anything on the airfield because all the height restrictions for safety, for all the navigation aids, etc. Aerodynamic, uh, you know, it's very important we don't damage the engines. Um, they require proper airflow when they, when they do their runs. They can't re-ingest the exhaust gases. So the aerodynamics of the facility need to be incorporated. And then the size, how big do we want to build this thing, right? Uh, and that's going to depend on the most common aircraft that's, that's doing runs at the airport. So where we ended up, in 2012, we opened up our ground run-up facility. And the pictures below show what it looks like. Um, very fancy three-sided facility with approximately 2,000 sound absorptive panels. Uh, it is designed to achieve an average of 15 decibel uh, sound reduction. And f depending on the aircraft that's being run in the facility, uh, the facility provides well above um, that. And depending, of, of course, where the receiver is located in the community as well. It's located right close to the, our, our main operators on the south side. And it accommodates almost you know, 90% of all our high power runs on the south side. I think the ones that couldn't do it um, in the facility, it was because you know, they couldn't access it because we were actually doing on, work on one of the taxiways. So we had to find them alternate locations um, one particular summer. Talk a little bit about emerging challenges. And this is my last slide. So when we look forward to say, where are some of the pressure points coming um, uh, um, in, uh, in terms of managing noise? First of all, there's obviously encroaching residential development. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the city center in Richmond is, is really densifying. Not a problem now, but you know, come 20 to 30 years, maybe an issue as more residents move in. But what we see in the industry is the introduction of new navigation technology. So everyone has a GPS for their cars, right? So this new GPS technology for aircraft is just coming in. Uh, it'll allow more efficient flight routes into and out of busy congested areas. And what this could mean is you know, the introduction of new flight paths where aircraft didn't used to fly. Now they could fly shorter routes into the airport and kind of introduce new noise into new areas. Um, and oftentimes it becomes a trade-off because these new routes are designed to you know, enhance efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And Canada has made some pretty aggressive um, international targets for reducing greenhouse gas from aviation. And you know, new aircraft in the fleet and new performance-based navigation are some of the ways the airlines want to meet those targets. So at some point, somebody needs to, um, I guess, tell the industry what gets precedence, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions or managing noise in terms of not having you know, flight paths over new areas. And uh, it'll be a very interesting discussion in the next coming years. So with that, I just want to thank everyone again for their time and attention. And I guess we can open the floor for questions. Rach, if you want to join me up here. OK, thank you very much. We usually clap at this point, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys could just share that mic for answering questions, because this one's going to be running around the room. One over here. Karen. Thank you. That was really interesting. And I'm just just totally a, a selfish question, uh, because I'm under the flight path of the medical helicopters that come into Vancouver General Hospital. Under whose uh, authority do they operate? That would be Transport Canada. So the airport is responsible for anything into and out of our facility. So Transport Canada we would be responsible for stuff out of Coal Harbor, Boundary Bay, and uh, the local hospitals as well. I completely agree with Karen. That was really terrific. I've, I live very close to the airport, and I've long wondered what's happened over the years that I've been living there. The noise has definitely reduced, and particularly because they don't use the cross runway as much. But I was wondering about that noise measure that you had at the very beginning that you said was unique um, to airport uh, operations. And uh, could you just describe what it is that seemed to have both perception and decibels in it, which sounded a bit odd to me, but yeah. 
So if you're talking about the EPNL, I think you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> uh, I think you'd have to ask somebody that actually deals with that metric, because we actually deal with, you know, like regular DBAs. But what my understanding is it takes tones and it corrects things, it puts weighting factors into it. And I've actually never seen a direct translation between EPNL and DBA. So if you find one, please, 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 please forward it to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just a question: Do you also have, um, or uh, do you work closely with the occupational hygiene team at the airport as well? Like in terms of noise measurements, especially personal noise measurements for pilots and all. So how it works at the airport is the the airport company is uh, basically we're we're a 400 people that actually work for the company. So we would take care of our employees in terms of occupational health. And then other other companies there would would be responsible. So if you see all the people working, you know, uh, on the apron loading bags, uh, that's a separate company, and they would have their own policies uh, in terms of hearing protection and uh, programs. We do work uh, somewhat closely with our uh, occupational um, uh, group. Uh, the manager is actually a former uh, student of the OEH program, Kevin Hong, is currently our manager of health and safety. Um, but Kevin's group it would be responsible for you know ensuring our maintenance guys are exposed to a certain um, level of noise while they work in their equipment rooms and stuff like that. Um, sorry, I was reading here in the CFS earlier that it says uh, exclusive of the departure and arrival procedures, no departing or arriving aircraft shall operate over the city at less than 5,000 feet above sea level. Um, between 2300 to 0, 0700 local hours. Uh, so how does that work for aircraft transiting through boundary to pit? So typically that would work if you're, if you're talking about that particular restriction. Perhaps you and I can talk a little bit later because that's a pretty specific question. Um, <laughs> that typically is built into the standard terminal and arrival routes. So obviously transit, you have to transit either under <laughs> uh, the aircraft flying instrument flight rules. So there's going to be some exemptions, but that particular restriction is generally built into the standard terminal arrival route. But again, talk to me after. Hi there. Um, I was curious about that regulation that you had about they couldn't take off between midnight and 6 AM. Is that for scheduling flights, or, or what happens if a flight has been delayed and is coming in from another airport? Oh, so it's uh, the um, the restriction that we have um, between midnight and six. That's the one that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, as Mark mentioned, um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> can you just repeat your question one more time, please? Sure. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm cheap and I'm only supposed to take my flight out flight, so I just don't know how they even exist then. But also, what happens if a flight's been delayed from another airport? Yeah. Yeah, so any delay airports, they, so they still need to get an approval. And um, now the uh, it's just the arriving, sorry, departing aircraft that will need an approval. So as Mark mentioned in the presentation, we take uh, the community uh, needs in consideration. So any the aircraft usually that uh, carries passengers and cargo that um, benefits our community will be approved. They just need to contact our operations center and make sure that, that they notify us. Okay, thanks very much for an interesting talk. Just looking at the number of questions that are, that are coming up that uh, goes to show that you, you've got a really great presentation. So as someone who's flown across the country, I've made six trips twice around the country in the past five weeks. I, it's fascinating. Um, my, I have two questions. One is that it's great to see that you've got a multi-stakeholder noise advisory committee that not only involves the the, the YVR parties, but community and First Nations. I thought that was really good. It, could you leverage that um, to drive down your complaints? You know, the 1754 number of complaints. Like, is there is there a way to manage? And what's the what's a lesson learned? Is there a singular lesson learned in being able to manage those types of noise complaint issues? Um, very good question. Um, in terms of our 
you know, in terms of what we do, you know, we, we try to involve as many people as we can in the conversation. Having citizen representatives on the, on the committee, you know, obviously helps because they generally know, um, they, they obviously live in the community. You know, I, I don't live in Surrey, I don't, I don't, you know, so having a Surrey rep definitely helps. Um, you know, when we deal with these people who generate a lot of uh, uh, complaints, it's often difficult when we talk with the committee um, because oftentimes the citizens want to exclude certain statistics. You know, if, if you have only if one person is generating 80% of the complaints, they, they generally want to look at, well, what are the other people kind of complaining about? So that's why it's nice to have, mm -hmm. you know, local people to help us kind of do that. And I guess you don't know their motivation for complaints sometimes, coming from people who don't even live near a flight path. But anyways, I leave that one alone. The second question is, um, have, you, have you looked at best practices at a similar airport elsewhere in Canada? I think of the Ottawa airport. It's the same distance to downtown Ottawa as YVR to our downtown. You ever look at their yeah, noise Yeah, so plan? typically what we do is we create you know, noise management plans every five years. And what we do on a regular basis is do, you know, we'll hire consultants to do a scan of practices around the world, not only in Canada, but you, know, you have to look at the Europeans. They're doing some, you know, you know, some novel stuff. Uh, the Australians are doing some really great stuff on community outreach. So we, we kind of try to expand that. Um, in, in turn, we also talk very often with our Canadian counterparts. And in fact, we're actually meeting next week here in Vancouver, um, where we're hosting a meeting of Toronto, Calgary, and Montreal to kind of just talk about you know, local issues and what are people dealing with, and is there things that we can adopt here in Vancouver, vice versa. OK, we have an online question here. Uh, and Sheila Farrell asks, uh, I'm at YVR on a regular basis, and I've noticed how quiet it is inside the building. What measures have you taken to reduce noise levels within the terminal itself? So that's something that would probably be best asked for from our engineering group, okay. uh, since they're the ones working inside the building. But I know we do put a lot of effort into, um, you know, keeping the ambient noise levels down, like the paging announcements. We try to keep it to a certain volume so it's not annoying. So there's a lot of efforts that we try to do, and you know we hire a lot of consultants into, um, you know, sound absorptive panels and stuff like that to try to keep the in terminal noise down. A couple of questions. I noticed your biggest complainer, according to the map, was out by Delta Air Park. Uh, are a lot of those complaints related to aircraft coming and going from there rather than YVR traffic? Uh, they are actually YVR traffic, and uh, the aircraft is pretty high. Um, the altitude is really high, but um, Again, as I mentioned, it's very subjective. That's something that might not bother myself would be a uh, concern to someone else. So, Fair enough. The other was, can you give me a quantitative difference between the noise from, a, say, a 757 and the 787 Dreamliner? Sure, I could actually, um, sure. It's probably, um, probably 10 to 15 decibels less. Actually, the 787, according to our noise data, uh, you know, it's what we classify as a as a large aircraft. It creates as much noise as a medium-sized jet. So it's that that quiet. Yes, absolutely. Sure. So well, a, a ten decibel reduction is what is that, uh, Murray? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass myself in front of you here. <laughs> <laughs> so four times as quiet, I think, is, is what it works out to be in terms of energy. Yeah, ten times less less time power, in, which, from an engineering perspective, is just that's that's crazy. Absolutely. Hi, are there measures of cum, uh, cumulative noise exposure at the community level, and does that factor into determining the airport's capacity for flights in and out? Uh, it doesn't necessarily factor into the capacity of flights, but when we look at the noise exposure forecast that I had put up that looks at compatible land use planning, that is a time-weighted metric over a course of a 24-hour period. And what it also does is it weights noise at night higher than noise during the day. It says, you know, people are more, uh, 
bothered by aircraft noise between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. So any operations that are occurring during those hours is penalized by 12 decibels. So um, you know it would be equivalent to 16.7 flights during the day, uh, and that's how those contours are created. So it does take into account you know noise during various times during the day over the course of a 24-hour period. I'm going to ask one final question about the the chapter certification. Um, does that happen on like a model aircraft that goes to a facility somewhere, or do, does each individual aircraft have to be certified on a regular basis that it's meeting those criteria? So it's done once at the time of you know prototype, but each different series of the air. So for example, the Boeing 737 has nine different series, you know, ranging from 100 to 900, and each one of those would have to be certified. And my understanding is each airframe and engine combination would also need to be certified. So for example, I can buy a Boeing 737 and I have the options of putting on GE, Pratt & Whitney, Rolls-Royce, CFM engines. So each one of those would have to be certified.